construction of the famed Academy of Art began in 1927. From its inception, master artists and student apprentices lived and worked here together. A graduate art school, the Academy's many renowned faculty and alumni include Eliel Saarinen's son, architect Eero Saarinen, and designers Charles Eames, Florence Knoll, and Jack Leonard Larson. Working in the same studios the artists use today, they helped shape mid-century design in America. Rafael Moneo of Spain received one of architecture's highest honors, the Pritzker Prize for a lifetime of great works. The exterior of his studio building for the Art Academy eloquently advances Saarinen's ideas, while the interiors provide technically sophisticated work areas. The 20th century will see a, a certain architectural evolution that recognizes that it is not anymore possible to relate architecture with craftsmanship. Still in Sarinen, architecture related with craftsmanship. We will try to do our best for producing an architecture able to keep the same ideals. I am not trying to establish any kind of parallel with him and indeed consider him to be such a wonderful architect that I did see myself following and for some reasons connecting with Sarin in my career and therefore I am very much taken by going ahead with this job. That's pretty cool, those guys out there in the woods. Gerhard Nadell, wow. director of the Academy of Art, uh, is a key member of the team uh, planning and programming and developing the building. Cranbrook Academy of Art is a studio-based program wherein we welcome 150 students from around the world in 10 disciplines of study. The new studios building will be home to 45 graduate students in three disciplines. On the upper floor of this three-story building will be the fiber department. The middle floor houses the ceramics department and the lower floor metal smithing. One of the most important characteristics of Cranbrook Academy of Art is, of course, that it's a community for artists. And uh, Mr. Booth had a wonderful idea when he decided to provide not only a home for all of the people that worked here, but a studio as well. Here we're standing in what was originally Aleo and Eero Sarnen's drafting studio. If you talk to students who were here back in the 1940s, they talked about the pleasure of space, six people in the department working with the artists in residence. Today we have about 15 per, per department and obviously need space. We were given the, the parking area behind this uh, wing of the museum, and then uh, we wanted to figure out how to relate the building that was going to be behind with all this magnificent architectural episode of the fountain, as well as, as connecting the building with the existing academy. And we thought that this axis it could be the, the beginning of the entire building. We have the beautiful Europa Fountain here and the Europa Plaza that leads to the old entrance into the museum. And Mineo created a very interesting idea, I think, when he decided that the main entrance to his new building would simply be on line with that axis. What was so critical was uh, a kind of reinvestigation about the components that comprise this institution. People come to visit the museum. The Academy studios are on the other side. There is a, a sense of, of separation between the two. And very early on came the notion of a possible linkage of the two. The two galleries that we're looking at at the corner of the building form a hinge, a kind of hinge that connects the museum and the Academy. The upper area will be a place that is not only for the exhibition of objects, but also a space where we can do wonderful projection of video work. And then on the lower floor, we have our forum gallery, which is the place where our students show their work on a regular basis during the academic year. Moving from the simple uh, geometric uh, uh, forms of Sarnin's architecture, we move to an area that is quite transparent, this building volume housing the private studios of the students, to a place that will be clad in metal. This building is envisioned as a place of industry where uh, 
the exterior of the building is designed to create something of the sense of energy of what goes on in the interior. We give to, to this uh, block of the building a certain um, character of a factory. We have the, this uh, sense of casual that uh, very often factories and industrial architecture used to happen. Visitors to the museum will be able to walk out onto what I refer to as a viewing platform and be able to look in the direction of the wall of windows which lead into the, uh, the studios in the ceramics and metals and fiber department where students are working. They'll be able to look to the east where we have our kind of focused area of industry and uh, I think see uh, that sense of the work in process so that that the activity of making becomes an important part of the experience of viewing the work. Aesthetically, the buildings are tied together, but at the same time are separated. On the interior, aesthetically, they're tied together by a system of ramps and stairs, and then also by a void. And that void is where all the change in levels is able to like, make the transition between the floors and tie the buildings together. The complexity in this building stems from the fact that we have many masses that are trying to come together in one single building. Um, the, every single function is almost expressed individually as a mass, as a volume by itself. Like for instance, the artist in residence suite is one mass, the main shop is another mass, the print shop is another mass, the uh, elevator tower is a mass. So what that does is that that creates a lot of three-dimensional corners to deal with. Um, and also many different materials trying to like come together and meet seamlessly amongst all this geometrical articulation. We start on the basic premise that the brick should be darker than the existing brick. So it provides that kind of anchor, you know, that kind of like exclamation point at the end of the museum. Something to stop, you know, the long linear roof line of the, of the museum from continuing on. And then as far as the height was concerned of the building, Raphael always wanted the building to be a bit shorter than the existing museum. So it would be a bit, a bit uh, subservient to it, uh, like a, a little brother, if you will. This is the only job that I've ever done in my life that I set the lintels that holds the masonry ahead of the brick. That was the only way that we could make the windows as the sizes that the architect wanted would work to guarantee that they'd fit. The fact that the structure is exposed makes things a bit more difficult to build in the sense that they have to connect in the proper way, in a very specific relationship to each other, that there is no secondary material that would come and uncover the corners or the places where materials meet. Now, in the galleries where we need a more uniform appearance, yes, we do have uh, coverings. Some of the shapes that we're trying to achieve with the drywall and the plaster are complex. The plaster wall goes up and then turn and then forms these coves. And so even when we use the, the skin, it is expressed as a skin. The veneer is read as a veneer, the structure is read as a, as a structure, an honest expression of materials. Now when you come here and you see that the building indeed uh, doesn't create any anxiety in the existing buildings, are just the contrary. I, it seems to me that they enhance what the, the, the other buildings are. It's not an imposing architectural structure, and yet it's dense and, and complex. The building maintains the, the same attempt the, the, to give the, the right answer in whatever corner you are. And that happens also in the construction itself. It's a sophisticated manufacturing building, really. I mean, you take thread and weave, and, and you take clay and ma manipulate it, and you take just rough pieces of steel and manipulate it. And, and, and this building is, is some sort of, a, sort of an echo or a reflection of that. It's really been designed to take that abuse and, and, to, and to still look, I think, a, a, as a building of some note. Uh, because of the, the, the exposure of all the elements in the building. And it's sort of like what goes on in it, so it's a reflection of that, I think. The new studios building provides an extraordinary range of spaces to accommodate a variety of individual needs. 
In the fibers department, we've been able to produce spaces with higher ceilings uh, for work that is larger in scale. We've been able to provide places for groups to meet together, places for installation work, places for group activities. In the old kiln room, where we had traditional brick kilns, they were only accessed by an elevator that connected the student studio space to the firing area. Now if you're a student in the ceramics department, you can produce your work in your own studio on the surface of uh, platforms that can be rolled directly from the studio down the hallway and directly into the kiln. A direct and fluid relationship between the process of making and the process of firing the ceramics. The, the design of these kilns also have an effect on how work is done in the studio. Right. Mm -hmm. It's to do with being efficient mm -hmm. and not letting anything get in the way of ideas. Mm -hmm. And I just think it changes the mindset. Mm -hmm. When you walk in here and you're a student here, these yeah. conditions mm -hmm. are just mm -hmm. make you think differently. Yeah. The metals department uh, is set up to accommodate an increasing range of work that goes on within that department, stretching all the way from jewelry making that is very intimate to large-scale architectural works. And the building itself can receive metal that is brought in on a truck, easily lowered by a new crane into a, an area that accommodates welding and sandblasting and a variety of outdoor techniques. I like the horizontality we are working with, and yet this horizontality is at, at the end very much subsumed in, in something common with the vertical void of the public spaces. Sound, and even in the workshop areas of the academy, uh, always added a, 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 an element of the hand. You would use a, a factory sash, an industrial window, but then put a piece of wood in between the window. So when I look at this window, I see that, that sensibility of the hand in relationship to the machine, as it were, and, and to nature. And I see a continuity between a certain aspect of sound and sensibility in our present time, which I think is very important uh, because Cranbrook is a, a living tradition.